Kia ora. Kiwi Kodja here, and welcome to episode 51, The Battle of the Causeway Part 2. This follows directly on from episode 50, so go and watch that one first if you haven't already. It's been two long, hot months since the causeway commenced. It's now only 70 metres from the par. A month ago, Te Paraihe sent messengers to Pakakepa, near the port of Napier, seeking assistance. But none is coming. They're on their own. The defenders consist of 600 men of fighting age, 400 women, the rest children. Since the siege began, many have been spirited away to southerly pa. The smell of human flesh cooking signifies groups that haven't made it. Canoes from the pa venture out on moonless nights and manage to pull sections of the causeway down. To Hugh Hugh increases the longitudinal stays and places armed guards day and night. The causeway has negotiated the deepest sections. Now there's nothing stopping its inexorable progress. The latest attacks on the causeway have been costly and the damage minimal. It irks to Hugh Hugh and all the chiefs that Nati Fatui Apati have free range of the lake. The Hugh Hugh organises an ambush party for where Nati Fatui Apati land, clear their bird traps and launch again. This is particularly galsome. Canoes on the lake notice unusual bird activity suggesting an ambush. Te Paraihe seizes the opportunity. He advises the bird gathering group they will be the decoy. They are to land 100 metres west of their usual spot. The ambush team await their approach, but see them going to a different place. They withdraw back into the bush, then run west parallel to the shore. Meanwhile, Te Paraihe launches six canoes with 200 warriors, half head to the west of the decoy, the other to the east. The ambush party exits from the bush and races through the mud towards the decoy. Shots are fired. One person's hit. The canoe pushes out into the clear water and passes the canoes heading for the shore. The ambush party of 30 now realise what's going on. They struggle back to firm ground, then race west, hoping to outpace the canoes, but little chance of that. The western fleet lands and heads east. The battle's short and never in doubt. The two Wharitoa die bravely. The few who break south are not pursued. Getting the canoes back is more important. The wounded and dead are loaded into the canoes. Two muskets have been captured, but all the cartridges are wet. From a high point in the camp, to Hugh Hugh has seen everything. His smile has turned to a frown. The ability of Te Paraihe to move his forces around the lake quickly is sobering. From the cheering canoes, he assumes all are lost. The canoes arrive back to much fanfare. The enemy bodies paraded through the pa. The butchering done in a carnival atmosphere by the water's edge. The lake surface boils as the eels ravage the entrails. Each head goes on a spear, then paraded to the front of the pa and staked for the enemy to behold. Te Paraihe enjoys the afternoon. It has been a welcome break from the worry. Before dusk, the Hu Hu counts the heads. Perhaps some have made it. His camp's also energised, but for Utu. The sooner the causeway's completed, the better. That night in the pa, there's great feasting on Kaitangata, singing and dancing. 
The next day, Te Paraihe observes a quarter of Te Huhu's force encamping to the west, another quarter to the south. He thinks Te Huhu should have done this earlier. Alas, escapes now far more dangerous. That evening, Te Paraihe sits with his chiefs, their cloaks keeping out the brisk wind. There's around 14 days before the causeway reaches the island. Ideas are proffered, but the head carver's suggestion resonates. Let us deny them the last portion. Let them swim it. Their muskets will be useless. I will build a puhara for you to deny them. What's to stop them changing course to avoid your tower, one asks. His solution meets with general consent. Work will begin in the morning. As talk dies down, their heads drop to their chests, and sleep comes. In the morning, crews are assigned to the required tasks. From the back half of the pa, every sixth timber from the palisade is removed and stacked. These will be used for the puhara. Other crew prepare the ends under the carver's instructions. Two palisade poles, shaped, then lashed together, will be the main building blocks. Canoes gather flax for the women to make rope. Time is of the essence. Sporadic musket fire from the causeway, 70 metres away, is currently inaccurate. But that will change. By midday of the second day, the two main support structures are ready. Canoes float the first to the front of the pa. Its base is located against the bank. Ropes from the pa are lifted into position and then the ropes are secured. The musketeers gather at the end of the causeway and a sporadic fire occurs. The second structure is brought around. Other larger canoes go out and do a mock attack on the causeway to draw the fire whilst the second support is raised. These supports give a safe working space behind them. The platform timbers are individually lifted into position. It takes two days of sweat and swearing. Special rigs are needed. Additional supports are installed. Anyone forgetting to stay behind the main supports attract fire. Work on the causeway and work on the puhara becomes a cat and mouse affair. When there's a critical operation on the causeway, it prevents the musketeers from a good shot. During such periods, the sharpened stakes are bedded and side palisading installed. This goes on for a week. The causeway is now only 20 metres from the island. Musket fire and spears have been exchanged, but the damage is minimal. The puhara is now complete and is effectively musket-proof. Both parties are continually adapting as the gap closes. Large stones are now stockpiled near the front of the pa. A good supply are on the platform. To Hugh Hugh knows the last 10 metres will be highly contested. He and his chiefs have been to the end and inspected the Paraihe's preparation a number of times. There are two portions of the causeway left. The first should be manageable, but the last could be very costly. A meeting at Hugh Hugh's camp discusses the causeway and the assault. All suggestions are going to be costly. Two plans are agreed to. The first is if they can complete the last portion and get musket and dry cartridges to the island. The second, if the last portion is not possible. Chiefs and their warriors are assigned their roles. Equipment's readied and the battle plans rehearsed. The causeway, being only two people wide, is unique for this battle, so rehearsals are important. The next three days should tell. Nati Maniapoto, under Te Arawai, volunteer to provide protection for the crew attending the last portion. The next day at noon, the crossbeams for the last portion 
are pulled 340 metres through the water to the end of the causeway. Both sides are ready. Musketeers are right behind the crew. All guns point at the Puhara. A crew member goes over the side and swims under the causeway, rope in hand. He emerges into the open and crosses the timbers supported by two ropes held by two men on the causeway. A warrior reaches over the Puhara and throws a spear deep into his back. The throw has taken too long. Half his head splatters those behind. To Arawai and six others dive in over the side, gather the rope and start roping the cross members. The Arawai looks up to the Puhara. His warning is shortened by a rock smashing into his face. Muskets are cracking, but the rain of rocks continues. Three with Tayaha reach the island, climb the bank and scale the Puhara. It's suicide. They fall lifeless into the lake. Those in the Puhara concentrate now on the rope holders. Spears and rocks are thrown. One is killed, the other retreats. The logs slowly sink to the bottom. Another group of Maniapolto ready to go in. But Tehuhu, who is behind them, stops them. It would be a waste of brave lives. The bodies in the water are roped, retrieved and carried back to camp. Te Arawai is the son of the great Maniapoto chief Tukorehu. Tukorehu hopes he will have some solace from the bravery of his death. Tukorehu delights at the course of events. The Puhara has lived up to expectation. He congratulates the head carver. Then news reaches him that the Arawai, son of Tukorehu, is one of the dead. His shoulders slump. This will bring the wrath of the Maniapoto nation down on him, his hapu, and probably his iwi. His chances of making old bones has plummeted. Same for his hapu. He lets out a long sigh, gazes upon his kin in the pa, then seeks the solitude of his foray. He appears again in an hour. The future must look after itself. The present requires his attention. Everyone is relying on him. Next morning, after breakfast, pre-battle speeches are just audible from the pa. Te Paraihe knows the time has come. Everything is ready. Everyone knows their roles and positions. Te Paraihe gazes from the parapet at his people with such affection. He recites a karakia to himself. They all watch him in silence. He reminds them of those that have passed. Their bravery and mana now rest with all here. It is a deeply moving oration. Many are in tears. There was a profound silence at the end. It is one of the minor chiefs that has to start the haka. By the end of the haka, they are battle ready. They hungry their family, then take their positions. Tehuhu's haka reverberates around the hills. Warriors start streaming onto the causeway. The eight musketeers out in front, those with ladders next, then the main body. Their progress is deliberate. It is an awesome sight. When the musketeers near the end, they take up positions on the westerly pole of the V, leaving the pathway behind them clear. Ladder bearers throw their ladders over the side and follow them in. Those behind go forward and dive off the end. If there is no space in the water, it's over the side. 
Rocks and spears from the Puhara take a deadly toll on those jumping off the end. Those in the Puhara can stay sheltered and just throw. No aiming is required. Warriors are directed over the side. As warriors reach the shore, the Paraihe orders the attack. All the action is on the western side of the Puhara. Nati Fatui Apati are shot as they run to engage, but there are pauses whilst reloading, and taia and spear clash. The battle area on the western bank is small. As more warriors arrive, Taparaihe sounds a withdrawal. The gate is closed and barred. The ladders are drawn up and scaling commences. Rocks and spears are thrown from the puhara with devastating effect. Dead and wounded are thrown into the water to make room for attackers. At the top of the ladders is the killing zone. As warriors fall, others take their place. As the last ladder arrives, the battle reaches a precarious balance. Few have got over, the numbers too small to matter. A stalemate is slowly being reached. Warriors are now dying for no gain. To Hugh Hugh recognises this and signals a withdrawal. His warriors retrieve the ladders and swim out to the ropes dangling from the walkway. Some so exhausted they have to be pulled up. It's a long way back to camp. Bodies float about the stakes. At noon, Paraihe sees warriors from the western and southern camps making their way around to Joy to Hu He hopes this is a sign of their going home. Alas, no. It is late afternoon, and to Hu's army is forming up again. To Paraihe knows to Hu will try something new, but has no idea what. Again, it's the musketeers, ladder bearers, then the warriors. This battle begins exactly as the first. Te Paraihe has a feeling of deja vu. The warriors stream onto the island, the ladders are raised. Those on the parapets brace themselves. Te Paraihe sees a group at the end of the causeway. They show no intention of diving in. They are preparing something. They have the rope thrown kataha spears. They are setting fire to straw strapped to them. Te watches the flaming spears whistle overhead. Some hit their intended targets, the forays. The super dry raupo erupts. Women and children sheltering in them flee. Some rush to the back of the pa and dive into the lake, horribly burnt. Te redirects part of his force. More start getting over the palisades. The fighting on the parapets is desperate. Te Paraihe gives up on the forays, commands those protecting the rear to join him in a counter charge. It is unexpected and decisive. Nati Fatui Apati outnumber and overcome those on the parapets. The flow over the palisade is stemmed. The battle gradually reaches a stalemate again. To Hugh Hugh accepts this reality. The conch shell sounds the withdrawal. Dead bodies flow out onto the lake. To Hugh Hugh has the musketeers provide cover, whilst those at the front of the pa are recovered. It is now obvious to To Hugh Hugh that with more ladders he will have success. Te Paraihe recognises what a close call that was. Everyone is in a state of exhaustion and shock. The relief of being alive manifests in incongruous displays of happiness and laughter. The adrenaline of battle slowly dissipates. The wounded are tended, the dead gathered. Families search for their fathers and husbands. Others hold their wives and children tightly. Many good men have died today. As dusk falls, 
the Paraihe gathers his remaining chiefs for a hui. He believes they will not survive another assault. The Iran nods of agreement. He advises them that the pa will be abandoned. He orders that the normal evening routine be followed. The first group will go when the moon goes down. The last when the fires burn out. They are to head south to the pa at Poranaho. With Tihuhu's western and southern camps empty, they should be able to leave undetected. Some grieving families store their loved one's head with their meagre possessions. Two women who were made widows today hang themselves from the puhara. It has been an intense day. When the moon drops behind the Ruahine ranges, the first group disappears into the night. The shuttling of the people continues in silence. Te Paraihe, with a few warriors, wanders the pa for the last time. He offers an incantation to two for his protection this day. They are the last canoe to leave. With enemies everywhere, he enters the canoe and pushes off into a dangerous future. Okay, let's relax a bit now and look at the historic record. I like Percy Smith the best. He puts the siege as being in late 1822. Also, no muskets are mentioned in the historical records. I believe they were there. Without them, canoes would have been able to harass, possibly even prevent the building of the causeway. I have, however, minimised their influence in the battle. The siege is said to last three months, but the way it's written makes it sound like the causeway was constructed near the end of that period. Percy says that the causeway came from the eastern shore, but geological sketches on Arksite clearly have it coming from the north. The timber for the causeway came from Te Ote Forest. A puhara, or tower, was built to dominate the causeway. Te Arawai, son of Tukorehu, was killed by a rock from the puhara striking his head. Flaming spears were thrown into the pa to set the forays on fire. Te Paraihe repulsed the attacks, but when night fell, abandoned the pa and headed for Poranga Hau, which is around here. So, the details and events not mentioned above are from me, putting myself in these chiefs' positions and imagining how these events would have panned out in detail. Suffice to say, my daydreaming comes from authentic happenings from that time period. Smith's and Henderson's references are quite difficult to get, so I'd like to give Ron Crosby a big thank you for scanning and sending the relevant pages from his library. Anyway, that's it from me. It's been a bit of a long one. Uh, if you've made it this far, congratulations. Take it easy. Stay safe out there. Hey, Kona. Catch you later.